We're in our series, Transforming Our Church. Transforming Our Church. And God has ordained that this message, I believe, would happen today. And last week, we dealt with Nehemiah chapter 1. And I don't want to leave Nehemiah. I don't want to depart from that thought. Today's going to help us with that. But remember last week, we talked about taking it personally. Taking it personally. And Nehemiah did that. And as you're there turning to Acts chapter 4, I want to remind you of what takes place in Nehemiah. In chapter 2, we find he arrives at Jerusalem, and he's there for three days. And while he's there for three days, he doesn't utter a word to anybody what God's laid on his heart to do. And in the still of the night, in the darkness, he and some of his men with him begin to travel the city to see the devastation, to see the destruction. It comes to a point where there's so much rubble that the animal on which Nehemiah is riding can't go any further. No way he can climb over it, no way to go around it, just the devastation is great. And once again, Nehemiah's heart is moved, and he sees a great task in front of him. And after three days, in chapter 2, verse 18, Nehemiah writes these words. After being there three days, after seeing the destruction, after riding through during the night to see what's going on, he says, then... I told them, the people in the city, the nobles, the leaders, then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. This morning, I want to do that. I want to tell you about the hand of God that's good. So what's that got to do with Acts? Well, I hope you put the two together this morning. In transforming our church, only God can do that. We need to understand that God is good. And we need something that this passage talks about. Verse number 33 uses what to me is just a mind-blowing couple of words. Verse 33 says, and great grace. What grace isn't great? But the Bible says, and great grace was on, on them all. Look with me as I'll read the passage of Scripture. Acts chapter 4, begin reading in verse number 23. And being let go, that's Peter and John. They've been arrested for healing the man at the gate beautiful, preaching in the temple. And being let go, they went to their own company. It's a good place to be. I'm glad I'm in my, in my company this morning. I'm at my church. They went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, that's the whole church. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, there is this praise, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. He who said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. That last phrase, and great grace was upon them all. We need great grace. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. Lord, I pray that you would anoint me this morning. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would move in a mighty way. 
Some of you have done so this week. We have seen it. And what I pray this morning would be no different. I pray the Spirit of God would fill this house. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that if there's any that lost, they would come to know you as Savior. For those that are running from you, they would turn and return, they would return back to you. Lord, I pray that, Lord, everyone would see how awesome our God is. And Lord, how much we need great grace. Lord, if we're to be the church you'd have us to be, continue to move forward, to thrive together, Lord, we need great grace. And that's my prayer this morning, that you would grant us just that. That, Lord, it would be said of Community Baptist Church, great grace is upon them all. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The passage of Scripture that I read, I'm going to go back and give you a little background on it. You find, I mentioned this a little bit, you find that what's taking place, the day of Pentecost is taking place, there's been a, the 3,000 souls that were saved, and we find the day of Pentecost passes, and then Peter and John, they're going to go to the temple. they got a plan. They're going to preach. They're going to preach Jesus. But when they get to the temple, they come in the gate, which is called Beautiful. It's a beautiful gate, and there was a, a man there who was lame. And as was, as was his custom, he was there all asking for alms. You know, we, we're, we're accustomed to that. And you drive down the road, and you see people holding up the little sign, asking for money. That's what he was doing. He was by the gate, beautiful, right outside the church, outside the temple, asking for alms. And as Peter and John come up, they're poor preachers. Things hadn't changed much. He's asking alms. You remember what Peter and John say? Remember what Peter says? Acts chapter 3 and verse 6. Silver and gold have I none. This is the great part. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And the Bible tells us, he didn't get up, he leaped up. And he went into the temple and started praising God, giving God the glory for what he had done. And then Peter and John, if they were already pumped, they were now pumped. And they go in the temple, they begin to preach Jesus. They begin to preach Christ. And as they do, all the religious people, all the religious leaders inside get a little upset. Have them arrested. How dare you come preach Jesus in the church, in the temple? You can't do that. So they, they arrest them. And then Peter and John, they stand before them. And you can read the scripture for yourself. The religious leaders, they're, they're in a quandary of what to do. As they talk among themselves, many of them have seen the miracle of themselves. And they say, we want to shut these guys up, but there's no doubt we saw a legitimate miracle today. And they took counsel among themselves what they should do. We don't want them preaching Jesus. But the man's walking around. He's still running around outside. He's been there for years. He's out there. Look at him. That's like the 50th lap. I mean, there's no denying a miracle that's taking place by these guys. What are we going to do? So they, they come up with a plan. They come out and say, don't preach anymore. Don't preach Jesus. And let him go. That's where the story picks up that we read. Being let go, they go back to their own company, the company of believers, Report to what has happened. And then we, we read what took place. This morning as we talk about the fact of great grace, we need great grace. I want you to know this morning, all men experience the grace of God. There is a common grace. The fact that you're, if you're not saved this morning, the fact that you're here is the grace of God. The fact that you're living and breathing is the grace of God. The fact that God has allowed you to do what you've done in life is the grace of God. But I would venture to say most of us today have known more than just common grace. We've experienced saving grace. We have this morning saving grace. Now, saving grace is available to whosoever will, to each and every one of us. We know the saving grace of an almighty God, the unchangeable God. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, 
we know that saving grace. But think about this verse. Great grace is upon them all. If you're here this morning and you have experienced saving grace, hopefully to you that's still amazing. But what would you do, what would you do if you could do anything to have great grace? Great grace. It's only available to the Christian. It was only upon the church. Great grace was upon them all. What would you do to experience great grace? This morning, I want to look at this passage of Scripture. I want you to see, if you will, four ingredients that stir great grace. There's four things that took place before great grace came. Four ingredients that stir great grace. They come back, verse number 23, and notice the very first thing they do. Verse 24. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord. If we're going to experience great grace, the first thing we need to do is have excellent praise. Excellent praise. This morning our service has been a little bit different because I want to make sure this morning we have praised our God. We have exalted him. He has worked in a mighty way. He has answered prayer. We need to praise him. We need to give him excellent praise. Praise. Notice their words. Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. We need excellent praise. This morning, when was the last time you took time just to praise God? I'm not just talking about praise the Lord and go on. How about just taking time to praise God? He is the Almighty God. He's the Ancient of Days. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the Alpha, the Omega. Praise God, He is my advocate. He's the beginning and the end. He's the bread of life. He's my buckler. He's my shield. He's the bright and morning star. He's the captain of my salvation. He's the chief cornerstone, my counselor, my consolation. He's the creator. He's a consuming fire, and He is Christ. Listen, he's the day star, he's the deliverer, the desire of the nations, the door. He's Elohim, he's El Shaddai, from everlasting to everlasting. He's the everlasting father. He's the faithful and the true. He's the first and the last. He's the father of the fatherless. He's the firstborn among the dead. He's my foundation, the fullness of my God, of the Godhead, and we are complete in him. He is God. He's the God of all grace. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the good shepherd that gives his life for his sheep. He's our great high priest. He is the great God. He's the head of the church. He's my heavenly father. He's holy. He is the Holy Spirit of promise. He's the horn of my salvation. He is the one whom my soul loveth. He is the great I am. The image of the invisible God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. His name is Jehovah. He is Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. His name is Jesus. He's Jesus Christ, the righteous, the judge of all the earth. He's the just one. He is king forever and ever. He's the king of heaven, the king of Israel, the king of the nations, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. He's the light of the world. He's the light that lightens the Gentiles. He's the Lamb of God, the land that was slain before the foundation of the world. He is love. He's a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He is the only mediator between God and man. He is merciful. He is a faithful high priest. He's the most high God. And I am his. And he is mine. He is the Nazarene. He's the nail of a sure place. He is one Lord, the only wise God, the only potentate, the only begotten of the Father. He's the Prince of Priests, the great physician, the Redeemer. He's my refuge. He's the righteous Father. He's the root of David. He is the rock of my salvation. He's the seed of Abraham, the son of God, the strong one. He is my strength. He is the truth. He is the true vine. He is wonderful. He is the living word of God. And he desires to be your savior, your Lord, and your all in all. He is worthy of praise. Before they received great grace, they praised the almighty God. 
gave him praise for who he was, the creator of the universe. The creator who is so all-powerful, yet so intimate that he wants a relationship with you and me. We need to praise God. It needs to be an excellent praise because he is worthy of all praise. We must praise him. If you have nothing to praise God for, then you don't know my God. If you haven't praised God lately, I'm going to tell you right now, you just sit down. And start thinking what God's done for you. And don't get up and move into a tear and start rolling down your face. And you begin to praise God. Let him stir your heart and give him praise for what he's done. Before there was great grace, there was excellent praise. Only was there excellent praise, but notice there was expectant prayer. Expectant prayer. In their prayer, the first thing they did was give praise to God. In verse 25 and 26, notice that prayer is based on Scripture. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, where did David say it? He said it in Psalm 2. Psalm 2, they quote Scripture. Why do the heathen rage? Well, they were experiencing that, weren't they? Because they were just let go from the heathen. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? They know why. Because they can't stand Jesus. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against Christ. And they tell how that happened. How that Jesus was taken by Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the people of Israel, were all gathered together. And he was crucified. They based their prayer on Scripture. It was expectant. I want you to get this. Understand this. This, this is amazing. Notice in verse number 29. If my nose just runs and my, my eyes water a little bit, don't worry about it. God's good. Amen. Notice in verse number 29, they had just been let go. Notice this. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Most of us would have stopped right there and talked from that a while, wouldn't we? And grant unto thy servant protection. Is that what it says? That's what, we, that's what we would have prayed for, wouldn't it? Oh, Lord, you see what they're saying? You know what they're going to do to me? Oh, Lord, protect me. No. Oh, did you see they're threatening? Now grant us boldness. You know what they're doing. You can take care of them. We're not even worried about that. Just give us boldness. Give us boldness. They had expectant prayer. They based their prayer on Scripture. They asked for power, not protection. Power. We need to pray for power this morning. We need to pray that the power of God would be upon us. Notice in verses 28 and 30. Notice the emphasis of their prayer. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Verse 30. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and the signs and wonders may be done by the name of the Holy Child Jesus. Notice that thy hand, thy counsel, thy hand. Our prayer needs to be as theirs. Their pr prayer emphasized God's hand at work in the life of the church. So I'm thinking about that a minute. I want, to start, I want it to sink in. They prayed. Their emphasis was for the hand of God to work in the life of the church. How many of us, our prayer is the opposite? That the hand of man would do God's work. It's a different emphasis. We need to pray that the hand of God would work in the life of the church. And the church isn't these four walls. The church is this body of believers. We need to pray for the hand of God to work in us and through us. When we begin to get our focus wrong and pray for God to help us do his work, or for us to work here, and do, it begins to be about us. No, God, let your hand move in me. Let your hand do your work in me. We need to pray that the hand of God works in our lives, works in our church. It is his work. I will build my church, he said. He didn't say the preacher would do it. He didn't say the deacons would do it. He didn't say the church body would do it. It's his work. It's his hand. 
Now, he will use us, and we need to, our prayer needs to be that he will work in us and work through us. But the focus is on his hand moving, not man's hand moving. There needs to be an expectant prayer. True prayer is asking, uh, asking God for his will to be done, first of all, in us. And as it is done in us, then then it will be done through us. You see, if God's work is not done in us, it definitely will not be done through us. Philip Brooks made this statement. He said, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your power. But pray for power equal to your task. But preacher, I can't do it. Amen. Pray for power. Don't pray for easy tasks. Hey, listen. God is moving. That's what I've got in my mind. And God has great things planned. Where are they, preacher? I don't know it all yet. But God's doing great things. And you know what? As a church, there may come a time we can look and say, God, preacher, we just can't do that. Pray for power equal to our task. Power equal to our task. When God gives us a job to do, pray for power. Because it's by his power that the task will be accomplished. Don't pray for task equal to your power, but power equal to your task. And notice what happens. As they pray, verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was quiet. It was shaken. We talked about when was the last time you gave God praise. Let me ask you this. When was the last time that you got along with God in prayer? I don't have to ask him. He's already excited. When was the last time you got along in prayer? And God shook you, brother. God moved you. Tears rolled down your face. and You, you may have gotten down all discouraged, but you got up and blessed. And you were ready to go. The task that you were crying over and weeping over, oh, it's nothing now. Because the power of God. When was the last time you were shaken by the hand of God? When was the last time you prayed to be shaken? When was the last time you prayed for power? Prayed for a burden? Can I share something with you this morning? We read about how Noah, about Nehemiah, then he told him how God was good. Can I tell you, we had a great week this week. But I'm going to tell you, the past three weeks and this past week has been three of the hardest spiritually fought battles in my life. I'm not just saying, I'm not making it up this morning. I'm telling you, two weeks prior to VBS, there were things going on. I was struggling. There was a spiritual battle raging in my life. This past week, I, I really can't explain it other than there was a burden on my heart this past week. It was heavier than any other part in the time of my life. The devil placed some doubts in my head, in my life. I had to get along with God, and God just had to, he reassured me, look, what you're going through isn't a bad thing. I've burdened your heart. And I'm going to tell you something. Your preacher shed some tears this week. He was burdened for the lost. Burdened like I've never been before. I can't explain that burden to you. I feel at times that, just to be honest, I had to put on a happy face. Because I was burdened. I didn't want the burden to come across as being sad, being discouraged. I was burdened. Friday morning, I had some more alone time with God. And Friday morning, in shower, I shed some tears with God. I got some things straight. What had happened this past week, what I was feeling was a burden for souls. A man doesn't sit and cry if it isn't the hand of God moving. We prayed expectant prayers. Last Sunday, as we closed our service, we had three men close our service praying that God would move, expecting him to move, and praising him. That's what we did, praise him for what he was going to do. We need to expectantly pray that God will move in a mighty way. He's done it. And when he does, lift our voices up in praise. Expectant prayer. 
be honest with you, I, I've been praying very gently. God just saved souls. And Monday, Monday came and went. And to be honest, I felt like I was a dud in my class. Nobody got saved. That doesn't help my burden any. <laughs> Tuesday, I spent some more time with God. Did some more soul searching on myself and rearranged my lesson. Came to the auditorium, sat right over here. I began to pray. And God brought something to mind, and I prayed. I said, God, would you give me five tonight? It was just, it, my number came to my mind. I said, God, would you give me five? Not, not me, I mean, they're yours, but would you, would you give us five tonight? You know what happened Tuesday night in your seat? Five people got saved. Five people got saved. Wednesday, I was still burdened, but I was a little bit pumped. I came back up here. I sat right the same place. I said, God, thank you. Would you give me five more? You know what happened Wednesday night? Got five more. That's good. Then Thursday came. I got a little bold. I got a group of men out here, and we prayed, and I said, well, give, would you go, give, me, give us 15? Thursday came and went, and how many we got? None. And I've been thinking about this passage all week. It was on my heart. And I got to think about this expectant prayer. And my prayer was specifically, Lord, 15, but would you give most of them adults, parents? I've seen a lot of children saved. One, one, one adult has been saved. Would you give us 15 and the majority of them be parents? And on Thursday, God spoke to me, not literally, but sparked my mind. You, you, know, you prayed for something, but you didn't prepare for it. Billy, you know good and well in your class, and Brother Bill was preaching, all your workers are back in the back. If I sent you 15 souls, nobody could have left them to me. I wasn't praying expectantly. I wasn't preparing for God to bless. What we do Friday, brother? We had preparations, didn't we? I've been praying. God convicted my heart. On Friday, before anything ever started, we had a plan in place. We had places for people to meet, places set up all around the church. We already tapped the people. If someone comes, you're first, you're second. This is where you're going to go. This is what you're going to do. We expected God to work and make preparation for it. On Friday night, seven souls were saved here. No one was saved on the way home. We prayed expectantly, and we prayed preparingly. We made preparation for God to work. And when we prayed expectantly and prepared as if God was going to work, guess what he did? He worked. If we want great grace, we have excellent praise and expectant prayer. When was the last time we prayed expecting God to bless? Making preparation for him to, to do so. Expectant prayer. There is in this passage of scripture. They prayed in one accord. Verse 24. And the hearts of the people were united. They prayed before God in unity. God was gracious to answer their request. We need to be unified. Notice if we want great grace, we must have excellent praise, we must have expectant prayer. Then notice in verse 31. They prayed, and the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. We need excellent praise, expectant prayer, and emptying of self. Emptying of self. The only way they could be filled with the Spirit was to be empty of everything else. You know, I praise God. Church, I'm, I'm going to praise you this morning. You did a great job at Vacation Bible School. A lot of work, a lot of effort. No doubt a lot of prayer went into it.
or in the week of July the 18th through 21st, you took your schedule and you cleared it of everything else. That's what happens when we take our lives and clear everything else out and say, God, would you use me? We need to empty our lives of ourselves so we can be filled with the Spirit of God. We cannot be filled with the Spirit and something else. Then we're not filled. There's been emptying of self. Now this morning, I'm excited about what God has done. Maybe this morning you're here and maybe you weren't at vacation Bible school for whatever reason. But if you're here this morning and go, these people are nuts. They're excited about kids coming to church. They're excited about people getting saved. And you don't have what I have. I'm a preacher, I'm saved. You may be saved, but you don't have what I have. If you can't get excited about God moving, something's wrong. And I can guarantee you it's right here. We're not filled with the Spirit. We're filled with something else. There is nothing this world has to offer that compares to what God gives. There's no amount of alcohol that's going to give you peace like God can give peace. There is now no amount of partying that can get you excited like God can get you excited about souls. There's no amount of sex that can fulfill you like God can fulfill you. Why do we keep running out there when the answer is right here? The answer is right here. It's him in here. If you don't know the excitement I'm talking about this morning, it's because there's not been, a, there's not been an emptying of self and a filling of the Spirit. If we're going to have great grace, we need excellent praise, expectant prayer, an emptying of self. I want to be careful, church. There's a warning in our passage. There's a warning in our passage. I want you to notice something. There's a warning. We're going to see these three things take place, but there's a fourth. Then there's great grace. Great grace in verse 33. The power of God moves. But then look at chapter 5, verse 1. But there was a certain man and his wife. Who was it? Ananias and Sapphira. There's a warning. Don't be that man. Don't be that wife. See, the great grace of God was upon them all. God was moving. But there was a man and his wife. Don't be that man. Don't be that wife. What is excellent praise, expectant prayer, emptying of self. But then notice verse 31 and 33. The fourth thing we need is explosive witnessing explosive witnessing. Look at verse number 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Then verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The explosive witnessing. Notice how the witnessing is described. Bold and powerful. Bold and powerful. Brandon, if you'll get ready. I, can, I could give you an illustration this morning. Brother David Gibbs tells it. It's his illustration. So I'm going to let him tell it to you this morning. About the boldness of God. So you listen as Brother Dave Gibbs, Dr. Dave Gibbs, CLA. He's preaching here. And he gives an illustration about the boldness of of God. Are you at 2112? Moses, Moses. That's and God video. then. The video is How to Have Great Grace. That's not David Gibbs. That's Doug Fisher. 
something that's wrong on the video. I'll tell you the story. <laughs> now, if you've never seen Dr. Gibbs, Dr. Gibbs is not a small man. I'm not sure what size suit he wears, but it's probably a couple of mine. He's not a small man. But he was preaching out of this passage of Scripture. Matter of fact, he was pre preaching the message, How to Have Great Grace. And he was talking about boldness. We have to have boldness. He was illustrating a story of how he has a, a friend, a black preacher. He may have called his name, I don't remember it. But uh, he was, Dr. Gibbs was at this preacher's church having revival. And uh, they were going to travel somewhere together. And they were going to get on a plane. Where well, the preacher told, told Brother Gibbs, said, don't worry about it. I got the tickets. I'll get our seating assignment. I'll take care of all of that. Just meet me in the airport. So Brother Gibbs shows up. The preacher's there, and, and uh, Brother Gibbs got the tickets. Yes, sir. Got our seating assignment. Yep, got it. Everything's taken care of. Brother Gibbs, okay. Brother Gibbs, well, let's, let's go ahead and get on, because, you know, if you don't get on first, you, you know, we're out of little cabin space, and you, you, you got to either check baggage in or shove it under your chair or something. So let's go ahead and get on first. Said, no, 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 no. We, we're going to be last. No, we need to get on first. No, just wait, trust me, we're going to get on last. And the preacher said, Brother Gibbs, how about pray for boldness? All right, Lord, give us boldness. He didn't know what was going on. Well, everybody files on the plane. Everybody gets their seating assignment. And finally, the stewardess comes out. They're the only two standing there. Everybody else is in the plane, sitting down, baggage up in the storage container. And the stewardess comes out. You guys are the last two. We're waiting on you. I mean, if you're coming, <laughs> last call. Black preacher takes his jacket off, hands it to Brother Gibbs. Takes his shirt, begins to unbutton it. Pulls it open, and on his T-shirt has the words written, you don't have to go to hell. Ask me, I can tell you how to get to heaven. They go up to the check-in counter. They would get, take a ticket. The stewardess asks Brother Gibbs, are you with him? <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> so they get on the plane. Here's Brother Gibbs. He's holding the preacher's jacket. The preacher's walking on the plane like this. <laughs> Brother Gibbs said, people start taking pictures. On the plane. Now, Brother Gibbs is a large man. And he tells he, he tells a story. He says, "You know, got to think about it. You know, if that would have been me, I mean, he's a large man. I have I have room for the whole Romans road." <laughs> but they're walking back, and of course, they're in the very back of the plane, the very last seat. And of course, the black preacher is not quickly making his way down the aisle. Making sure everybody sees. Gets all the way back to the back, last two seats. He sits down, him and Brother Gibbs. He says, as soon as we, as soon as we sat down, one of the stewardesses came up and says, when this plane lands, do not leave this plane. God sent you to me. The plane takes off. The plane arrives at its destination. When they pull up to the terminal, terminal, everybody unbuckles. Seven people walk to the back of the plane. David gives an illustration and says, talking to the congregation, he said, Preacher, well, that's not my style. But what is your style? And Brother Gibbs makes his admission. He says, my style is often the people on that plane are no different when they get on than when they get off. Because I'm not bold. We need the boldness of God. We need the power of God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew 
and offer to the, to the Greek. If we want great grace, we must have excellent praise, expectant prayer, the emptying of self, and an explosive witness. Church, we need great grace. Great grace to continue. Great grace to stand strong. Great grace to be unified. Great grace for whatever God has before us. We've seen the hand of God move this week. We need great grace to pray that God's hand stays right here. It keeps moving right here. And that it never leaves right here. One of our mascots this past week, we had, if you were here, you saw the different characters on the walls. Going to the left one was my favorite one, was, sit, was sitting right over here on the wall. The little puffin, Piers the puffin. Each mascot had a message for us every night. Piers the puffin, I love his message. Trust the Lord and get on board. Hey, listen, God's moving. God's moving. It's time to trust the Lord and get on board. Amen. This train's not stopping. Amen. This train's bound for glory, and it's not stopping. Amen. And I praise God, he's moving here, and I'm getting on board. Amen. If you can't get excited, well, bless your heart. Amen. I'm going to get excited and praise God. You know, preacher, what's he going to do? I don't know. I've got a few things in the back of my mind I think he's doing. <laughs> and when the time's right, I'm going to tell you about how good God is. But God's good. It's time to trust the Lord and get on board. Nehemiah, 52 days to accomplish something that hadn't accomplished in decades. Do you realize this week got accomplished in five days, but it took us more than five months to do the rest of the year? Because God's hand was in it. We need great grace. But there's four ingredients. Are they in your life? Excellent praise. Expecting prayer. Emptying of self. And exploding witness. Then it says, great grace is upon them all. Father, we come to you. Lord, we need great grace. Lord, we praise you for the mighty hand of God. Lord, 18 received you as Savior. 18 were saved from their sins, saved from hell. Lord, they were made sons and daughters of God. Lord, they have an eternal home in heaven. Lord, they've started a relationship with you. They've been granted a relationship with you. The creator of the universe. Lord, they've experienced forgiveness of sin. Only you can do that. You are the almighty God. You are the unchanging God. Lord, your plan of salvation has not changed, and it will not change. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I pray this morning, if there's one that does not know you as Savior, Lord, the Spirit of God will convict that soul this morning. Lord, and today, where they would understand how they can be saved from their sin, how they can escape from eternity in hell, and know Know according to your word. Know according to the Bible how they can spend eternity in heaven. And know they're forgiven of their sins for all eternity. Lord, I pray for Christians this morning. Lord, I pray that Lord, they would get on board. For those that are running from you, Lord, they would stop running. Or they would turn to you. Or they've trusted you with their eternity. Or Lord, have failed to give you.
today, tomorrow, the few years, the decades that we live on this earth. Lord, I pray that they would realize the foolishness of that state of life. How we can trust you with eternity, but can't trust you with today. Can't live our lives today the way you told us to because we don't trust you. We've got better plans because we're better than you are. We know better than you. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to empty ourselves of self and fully rely on you. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, is there someone here this morning that would say, Preacher, I know this morning that I am not saved. I know, I know I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. And to be honest, I'm not sure, maybe what are you talking about? I'm not sure that if I were to die, I'd, I'd go to heaven. I, I, just not, I don't know it. 